Welcome to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. I'm amped for this deep dive into Connecticut organized crime with my main man, Jamie Lawton, the mob buster of all mob busters in the Constitution State. <laughs> Jamie, thank you for joining me. Come on, will ya? I mean, you can't <laughs> set me up like that. <laughs> team effort, brother. Everything was a team effort, not just me. So. Uh, no, I didn't know I'm not trying to. Obviously, here at the OG, we give mad props to the uh, all the uh, alphabet agencies and the, and the work that they do. I've developed some great relationships with, with uh, people like yourself over the last two decades, guys that have, I could, I mean, my entire career of reporting and researching can date back to a, a, a group of FBI agents in Detroit or retired FBI, had just left the office. I was getting into this in the mid 2000s. They had just left the office. And for my first year, I, they literally sat with me, schooled me, put me on to other people that could school me. And then it all, you know, was like a domino effect from there. So I, you, you know, you don't have to tell me, man. I, everybody, I, I everybody on those, uh connecticut oc squads you're 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 the you're 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 the uh standard bear that's what we're going to talk about and and you're going to kind of thank you prop them up because we know they did a great job sure. uh so let's kind of just jump in um jamie was was working oc in the uh, late 90s 2000s 2010s um he is aware of some of the stuff that I've been reporting in the last month. I also want to just talk about, you know, I, I just, I, 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 I bury the lead here. I talked about how all of my research in, in Detroit started with these FBI agents. I can trace, you know, I've known Jamie now for about uh, 18 months or so. And you know, Jamie's the one who really kind of keyed me into all of this um, and, and got me hip to a lot of what was going down in Connecticut. So, um, I'm excited to bring him on here and, and be able to talk about what he can talk about. So uh, last month, I broke the story that there is a newish leader, uh, crew boss, not necessarily a made guy or a skipper, uh, but of the Patriarch of Crime Family's Connecticut branch, the old uh, wild guy Grasso crew, uh, Beaver Ascensia uh, died in 2021, um, he was pretty young, youngish. I think he was six, in his 60, early 60s. Uh, and I'm reporting that a longtime, big time earner, um, I think he's half Italian, uh, Eddie Perrette is now running things for little Eddie Leto. Good looking Maddie Guglia Medi in Providence and uh, the Denunzio brothers in Boston. He is their point man in Connecticut. Um, you worked, Eddie. Eddie took a drug pinch in the 2000s, did a couple years, um, owns a place called Doma, which is a, a pretty accoladed Italian restaurant. Um, yep. People hang out there. Uh, guys from both the Patriarchs and the Gambinos. So hand, I'm going to hand it over to, to, what do you remember about Eddie Perrette? Well, what happened was I was on a drug task force, a drug gang task force. And I, with state police, New Haven PD, there was a joint task force. And we started getting quite a bit of intel about how local Latin kings were working with Latin kings, in case people don't know, it's a, it's a street gang, almighty Latin king nation that they were the, working with. Pretty much the number one Hispanic organized crime yeah. group uh, outside of the Mexican. A lot, I mean, a lot of Latin kings here in Connecticut, they have them up in Mass, a lot in Springfield, New York. It's a nationwide uh, gang. Based on Chicago, uh, they have a big presence in, in uh, New England and New York. So we had LCN associates and ultimately a soldier who was Anthony Senzi at the time was the kind of at the top of the heap that were working with Latin Kings selling drugs and they were they had a bookmaking operation 
which was it was very interesting because it was one of the first I'll show you how long ago it is was one of the first offshore bookmaking operations that was going in the United States. And what the way they used to have it set up was all the calls that you made, if you wanted to call up and make a bet, you'd have an account. When you called in, you were actually calling to the country of Costa Rica. So it was offshore, so it was kind of quasi-legal. It wasn't legal here, but it was, it was legal in, in, the, in the country of Costa Rica. And this Latin King LCN connection crew were using that system to do bookmaking. Extension of extortionate credit um, for the gamblers. And they were also selling a lot of drugs on the side. So we started a case that we called Wise Kings. Um, and we ended up doing a Title III wiretap on these bookmakers. And was one individual uh, that was in the middle of it. And his nickname was Cito. And we were on his phone and we got LCN figures that would pop up in it. We had Latin Kings that popped up and it was a really, really interesting phone. And then the main target died of a massive MI. He was in his mid 20s and he died of a massive MI. And the phone kind of sort of fell apart. So we had to just pick and choose who was indictable and who wasn't. What's, a, what's an MI? And one of the guys who, who popped up prominently in that case was Eddie Perret. Jamie, and at Jamie, one point, just, which, what's an MI? You said he died of an MI. What does that mean? Oh, a, a heart attack. Myocardial oh, okay. infarction. Oh, okay. Attack. I just want to make. I didn't. I didn't know what that meant. So I'm guessing my audience wouldn't have understood what that meant. So he died of a heart okay. attack. Yeah, he died of a heart attack. Actually, at the hospital, and okay. um, it, it, it obviously it we couldn't wiretap him anymore because he was dead. <laughs> so. We had to kind of take what, what was left over, um, and we started working on Eddie Perret. And he'll, if he's listening to this, he doesn't realize he was driving around in a car that we put a tracking device on at three o'clock in the morning. So we were following him, seeing where he went, and maybe two or three weeks after we put the tracking device on his car, he sold the car. So, of course, I'm working for bosses, and they're like, you got to get that tracking device back. And the car ended up going all the way out. I think it went out to Michigan, actually. And we had to get it. We had to go to whoever. I can't remember who bought it and get the tracking device off of it. But Eddie was a really smart, active bookmaker and kind of a straw that stirs the drink type guy for these, these people that were around him. He and knew he, everybody he in New Haven. He was smart. He always paid his bets off. Um, you have a lot of bookmakers that, that still don't pay their bets off or they try and welsh out of it. He always paid his bets and everybody trusted him. But, you know, he he had muscle around him. He had guys that would enforce for him and, and collect debts for him. And he was slick. He was not an easy target to do. From, from what I can understand, he he started on record with, the Gambinos, um, and for for people that might not know Connecticut, uh, you have three main families that operate there: the the Gambinos, the Genovese, and the Patriarchas, which is the New England Mafia. That's not to say that other groups don't have action there. Not to say the Bananos or Lucchese's, uh or or Columbos. I know Columbos have had. I should say I, I should say that there's four main groups that go. I, I think the Columbos have a, a, a good amount of action. Uh, Gambinos, Genovese, uh, and then Patriarchas, and then uh, Lucchese and Bananos have stuff there, but they haven't been traditional powerhouses in Connecticut. So you have all these, my point is it's it's almost like a no man's land or is a no man's land with all these different crime families uh, operating in a state that's, you know, you can get from one one half or from one part to the other, you know, from top to bottom, you can get go through the state in an hour. Uh, yes. And you have all these different groups, and then within those groups, these OC figures who all, I'm sure, know each other because it's a small state, but they all represent different groups. So it makes it, I guess, a little bit stickier than maybe. The way it's been set up since I was assigned to the New Haven office was this way. The New, New Haven County and some of the counties around New Haven County were traditionally New England crime family. That was run out of Providence. It was run out of Boston. 
when Frank Salemi was the boss. And then when Louis Menacchio took over, when Frank got locked up and went into Witsec and everything, when Louis took over, it was run out of Providence. So Providence sold. And now, and now it's back. And now it's back to Boston. But now Providence it's back to still, Boston. But now Providence it's still bounced, has a right. Has still has a, it's a bounced story. back and forth a bunch of times. Um, I interviewed Frank Salemi one time. I asked him why he picked Louis Menacchio. He kind of rolled his eyes and he said it was a big mistake, but one of the reasons he said he picked Louis was he wanted to keep Providence happy. That's rich. You know, so, just to digress for one second, that's a rich statement coming from Cadillac Frank because all due respect to Cadillac Frank, and I met him a couple times and we were actually working on a book proposal together. I've, I've told the story before uh, that never went anywhere, but that was a he, he rolled his eyes at it. That was a good choice. Manu, Manucchio put that family back together after Salemi had torn it apart with his, well, you know, ego and, and rampage of vengeance uh, on people that had tried to kill him back in the 80s. Uh, so it's just, it's, Manucchio, I know, I know that Manucchio is somebody, I know that Louis is somebody uh, that, that elicits strong opinions on both sides. People either love him or have a dislike for him, but he 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 had a, a good 15 year run where that family got stability back and respect back after a lot of problems in in the uh late 80s early to mid 90s toward the back end of the time that Monaco was running things he was driving everybody and his family nuts because right. he wouldn't rule on anything he wouldn't right. get near anything too um, cautious. He wouldn't really get involved in anything that involved another family, which a lot of times, New, you know, as New England got weaker and weaker, more and more, there was more and more encroachment from other families up into Massachusetts. Right. And he would never get involved in that type of thing because he was always afraid the conversations were, were recorded or he was going to get in more trouble than he was already in. Well, listen, so, this, is, this is really in some ways 35 years in the making. You can trace it all the way back to when Billy Grasso gets killed uh, in the summer of 89. People know it, bringing Frank Salemi back into the, to the story, you know, the double hit on, on a, a hot summer day in June of 89. The Boston guys try to take out Salemi and Grasso on the yeah. same day. They killed Grasso. They're unsuccessful in, in killing Salemi. He survives as a, you know, six shots or whatever, seven shots. But ever since then, I mean, there's there's blood in the water. I mean, there's never been a, a force of nature like Billy Grasso where people knew that they couldn't encroach without him killing them on the spot. But it's been kind well, of a he, musical chairs of people trying to get that standing back for for Connecticut uh, in in the New England mob orbit. I mean, when Billy basically took over the state and became a capo, he literally drove. He drove up 91, and he threw Tony Volpe out of the city of Hartford. Tony had been sitting up there as an associate. He, was, he never he never got made. He'd been sitting up there as an associate forever, and everybody knew exactly where to find find he him. Got, he, he, got, he, eventually, so he eventually got made, but it took him a while to get made. Yeah, I mean, most of the, most of the time, he, he got made, apparently, not too long before he died. Yeah, I know. They, they made him late. They made him late. Most of the most of the time he was he was active in LCN activities. Right. He was an associate. Yeah. And he was a Genovese associate. So as you were saying about the state, it's 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 odd because you 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 had two during the time that I was investigating LCN, you had two soldiers sitting in New Haven that weren't all that active. That was Mario Grasso, that's Billy's son, and Anthony Asensio. And then down in Stanford, the Gambinos had moved after Frank Piccolo got whacked. The Gambinos had kind of moved, drifted, and, and Tommy DeBreezy got whacked. The Gambinos had drifted down into Stanford, and that was kind of their seat of power. It was closer to New York, and they were down there. And then up in Hartford um, and into Springfield, that was all Genovese. Right. So you had three families kind of peacefully coexisting in different parts of the state doing different types of things. So, and then we had yeah. a, 
you know, we did a, on my squad, a couple of agents, we did a massive carding case. Um, and that well, that's, a whole, that's, a whole, that's a whole episode. So I'm going to try, Jamie is just a wealth of information. I'm going to try to do a series with Jamie. Um, so he, if people remember or remember, I shouldn't say remember, it's, it's pretty recent in the last year or two or two or three years, there was a, there's been a Netflix, uh, untold on the story of the Danbury Trashers hockey team, um, which was a, a present from a mob figure, uh, to his son, um, in the, in the late nineties, early two thousands, uh, this guy was was a right underneath Maddie the horse. It's a fascinating case that I want to do a whole episode on with you. You you got you have the wrong guy. I was the oh the, I'm sorry the, the case no the case I, I worked on the case. I had a role in the case. The case agent on that case is one of the best FBI agents I ever worked with, named Jeff Waterman. So you're talking. So you're talking agent. about someone that before, when you just referenced. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump in and hijack me. I thought you were talking about the Danbury case, the Danbury Trashers, and I was. Oh, you were. Okay, you're Not just that saying case. that you weren't. I wasn't the main guy. The agent. The, 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 but I would love to have both off. you guys, both you guys, on to talk about it. You you're better off with just Jeff. He knows that okay. case backwards and forwards. We had a, an undercover in there who was incredible. It was an enormous case. I think I think it was thirty or forty arrests. And it took us three days to do all the searches that we did. And what ended up happening as a result of that case was most of the LCN activity, the actual LCN figures that were involved were down in New York. And my supervisor at the time, named Bill Reiner, who was just an incredible leader, he was really good at picking out which agent would be good for this job, and which agent would be good for that job. After we had done the Wise King's Wire, he decided to move me completely off of Safe Streets and move me into um, doing nothing but LCN and organized crime. And one of the things he asked me to target is all the New York soldiers. Nobody had really paid a lot of attention to him, particularly when we were doing the, trasher, the, the case with the trashers and the Pale Rider case. So those guys were just, nobody had really been doing any surveillance on them or had any intelligence about them. And my supervisor asked me to start looking at that. And that's when I started focusing on Anthony Asensia and finding an informant to, to get in, information about what he was doing. So and Asensia had already had done about five, maybe, maybe three years in jail on a bookmaking case that predecessors on my squad had done. And when he got out of the county, I just he just really hated jail more than the average mope. He just hated it. And he really didn't want to go back. So he was when he got out, he was extremely cautious about what he was doing. He was never as active as he was when he went in. We're talking about Beaver. And Beaver said he was tough to he was he was tough getting intelligence about him. He was very a low, low level activity from him. And, and Mario Grasso was never really an active soldier either. So we ended up kind of fishing around a little bit and, and getting bits and pieces and putting a lot of different types of things together. Yeah. So let me set this and up. So I'm gonna and then I'm gonna during sorry, finish. During that time, um there was an associate of Asensias who was very disgruntled because he got the most jail time out of anybody that went away. And Nobody took care of his family. He had a mom that was sick and other family members. He was angry about that. And I had heard a lot of information about him, and I thought he was a guy to cold flip. In other words, you just approach him and, and you try and flip him. He's not jammed up to see if he'll cooperate. And took a lot of time, and, and we did. We got him to, to cooperate, and he started acting as a source for us on our squad. And he got involved in a bunch of different cases. But one of the reasons, one of the things that he was telling us about was that there was a renegade member of the Gambino crime family out of Bridgeport and Stanford that was shaking down and threatening all the New England crime family bookmakers. 
And he basically decided that he wanted to take over all the bookmaking activities and some of the narcotics activities up in New Haven County, up in the area. Um, and he was going from bookmaker to bookmaker who were all kicking up. You're, to talking Eddie about, Perret. you're talking about Sonny Sooner. Yes. Okay. Raul yeah. Sooner, Sonny Sooner was a teenage errand boy for Frankie Piccolo. Yes. Uh, and then came, a, I don't think he's another guy that I don't think he'll ever get a button because he's not a uh, full breaded Italian. I think he's half Spanish, half Italian, but uh, was exactly. very, very liked, very trusted by a lot of yes. powerful Gambinos. I think even to, to, to today. But we're talking about a kind of a takeover attempt that Sonny yeah. Sooner launched in around 2006 um, yes. and targeted Beaver Ascenza's crew and all the the patriarchal rackets in the area. Um, and I'm going to throw it back to you, but it's, it, it's interesting that this thing resulted in a couple of sit downs um, yes. and then, and then a bunch of people went to prison, but in the sit downs, you had the um, patriarchal guys from Providence coming in or being brought in to, to sit down with the, with the Gambinos over this. And after the sit down, the, the Bobby DeLucas and the good looking Maddie's, well, Maddie wasn't involved because Maddie was in prison at that point, but the Bobby DeLuca is mad at his own guys, basically saying like, you brought this upon us. You, by you guys not being on your right. P's and Q's, you let these guys in a matter of a couple of years come in and, and gouge us. So like he was, yes. it's just interesting that the, the opinion from the patriarchs, even though they had to stand up for themselves in those sit downs, they almost were like, they blamed their own guys for allowing it to happen. They should have yeah. because they did. I mean, Sonny, that's Raul Sooner's nickname. Sonny came up and muscled. We interviewed probably 20 bookmakers. He threatened to kill people um, it's real if they brutal. didn't start kicking up directly to him. Hmm? It's real brutal. I, I, I wrote a story recently on my Gangster Report website, and I, and I uh, break down some of the um, instances that uh, Sonny Sooner uh, atta attacked people. Uh, in one case, he, he baseball batted a guy's uh, knees. Another case, yeah. he... he the same, I think it was actually the same guy, uh, owed him $13,000. Uh, he baseball bats him when the right. guy refuses to turn over his Corvette. Uh, right. He says to Sooner, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give you my Corvette. And if you take it, I'm gonna call the police and, 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 and uh, report it stolen. From that, he gets his Sooner baseball bats his knees. A yep. month later, he calls him to a meeting in Milford. Um, puts a knife to his throat yes and then you guys were able to tie him to the attack because he cuts himself when he's putting yes. the knife to the guy's throat bleeds on the guy's clothes and your dna you're able to dna match him to the yeah the, the the toughest part about that whole case is ironically is he the the victim had brought his jacket to the cleaners and left it there Never picked it up. And we couldn't find the jacket. So I, we had, and this cleaners was getting ready to go out of business. Myself and another couple of agents spent about four hours searching that in every piece of clothing in that cleaners until we found that jacket. We ended up finding it. And then we sent it to the lab and tested it for DNA. And it came back uh, with the victim's DNA on it. So that's part of the way we made him. The other thing that occurred was part of Sonny's crew was this guy who was an extremely active burglar, residential and commercial burglar. Bobby the Cat. Taglia, Taglia Ferry? Yes. Yeah. And Taglia Ferry screwed up because he burglarized a Connecticut state senator's house <laughs> in the middle of the day over in Hamden. And in the middle of the burglary, or toward the end of the burglary, he, he, he hears the front door open up. He always went in through the second story. He used to use these climbing spikes. He'd, he'd nail them into the side of the house. He'd, he'd chinny up, go into the bedroom window. 
he was only going after cash and jewelry. He didn't get, get electronics or anything like that. He had a running, he had the same routine he used. He had a running suit on, he had a pouch, he'd put all the swag in there, and then he'd shinny back down the side of the house and go to his car. So in the middle of this burglary, the state senator's wife came home because she had forgotten something on her way to a meeting. And Tagli Ferry saw her come through the front. He ran down the stairs and hit her by mistake and knocked her down. So now it becomes a robbery. But what was more important than that was this is not long after the horrible crime that had been committed over in Cheshire with that home oh, invasion. The, and it turned oh, into my the, God. Makes your stomach what, turn. For people that don't know, the Cheshire murders, there was an HBO documentary on it. One of the most depraved crimes and forget about Connecticut. I mean, these two guys bust into this house, uh, rape the women, set it on fire. Everybody dies except the husband. Oh, God, it's brutal. And what happened was the, the state senator of Connecticut rightfully had really jacked up home invasion uh, guidelines, sentencing guidelines. So Tagliferi knocks down the state senator's wife. She gets a slight injury, but she still she gets injured. He jumps into his car, takes off. Hand to PD, arrests him. I get contacted um, because they knew we were working the case because a hand in police officer was on our task force. And we ended up interviewing him. And I told him that he was looking at doing probably about 20 years because he had a bad sheet. So he flipped. So we started working Taglia Ferry into Sonny, who was Raul Sooner. And one of the things that Sonny wanted to do was he wanted to get a gun because he, he wanted to start murdering these bookmakers that weren't cooperating with him. So we used an inert, silenced gun with an obliterated serial number that we got from FBI headquarters. And we had Tagli Ferry sell uh, Sonny that gun. And when he bought it, he bought himself a 10-year sentence. Yep. With his with his criminal history, plus it was a silenced gun, plus it an obliterated serial number, he was looking at a lot of jail. That was March of 08. So, that was March of 08 when you guys busted him uh, on the silencer case, and then he got hit with the racketeering case the year yes. after that. Um, I want right. to. I, I know we're all over the place here, but I, I think there's some some rhyme to the uh, some rhyme to our reason or reason to our rhyme or whatever the the, the terminology is. I want to, you, you were mentioning the home invasions, and I just want to get your take on this. Um, so there was a, a, a game, a, a pretty res powerful, respected Gambino uh, that lived in Connecticut named uh, Nick the Greaser, Nick the Greaseball, Malia, Malia. Malia, Nick Malia. Yeah. And um, his house, uh, there was a home invasion, a burglary stick up uh, at his, residence over a decade ago um and one of the people that was suspected of playing a role was a patriarcha crime family associate a, a black guy named napoleon uh, andrades or nappy who was a bodyguard messenger driver at some points for louis uh, minocchio i know that might sound strange, but <laughs> um, and he got he had to do a prison sentence for something not related to the home invasion. And he got out a couple years ago. And within a week, he was killed in the parking lot of his halfway house in Pawtucket. Um, a lot of people believe that that was ordered and carried out in response to the home invasion of, of uh, Nick the Greaseball's house. Does that, does that kind of fit with what we were talking about before and just the way that these guys, the way these guys operate and how you have the cross-pollination of these, these groups and how sometimes it gets messy? I, I don't have any personal knowledge of that. Um, when that whole thing happened, um, but you do know you do know Nick, though. You can talk a little bit about. Oh, Nick. oh yeah. yeah. I mean, Nick Malia 
was in Stanford as part of the Gambino crime family forever. I mean, he was down there with with Tony McGaley and all the this the the like I said after Tommy DeBreezy got murdered in Bridgeport, who took over for Frank Piccolo when Frank Piccolo got murdered. The seat of power for the Gambinos kind of permanently moved to Stanford, mm-hmm. and the guy who's kind of running things down there now is a guy named Dean DePreta. Um, who's been active with that family for a long, long time. Yep. He was uh, um, a guy that went to prison, came out about five years ago. And uh, I've reported in the last month or so that uh, they called him, they call him Baldino, um, yep. that uh, Mr. DePreta is now the guy that's running Gambino Affairs in Connecticut. I don't know if that means that he's a skipper. I know that he has, I shouldn't say I know, I've, I'm well sourced that he has been made since he came out of prison. Um, he hadn't been made when he went away, but he was, again, kind of like Sonny Sooner, kind of like Eddie Perrette, not made, but has the status of a made guy and not just a made guy, but like a quasi skipper. So um, let's talk about Dino. Most of the time I, I was working organized crime, DePreta hadn't become a soldier. He was always no, he an associate. No, just recently, since he got out of prison in the last five years, I'm told he got a butt. Yeah. Um, the, the Gambino thread that was ironic back then, and a lot of your listeners might not know about this. I, I don't know how much you've talked about it, is that the guy who was very active coming up to Connecticut at that time was Nikki Skin Stefanelli. Yeah, who the Gambino who was wired up, uh, got a ton of incriminating conversations from multiple families and then ended up killing himself. Uh, and the guy that he blamed for having to flip, uh, a guy that uh, they called him Joe Phoenix. I, I think yeah. his last name was Joe Ross. I think his real name is Joe Ross. But uh, so, yeah, so Nikki Skins, Nikki Skins wired up against a guy. For me, he was working targets up in Boston. Um, he did some targets in, in, in New Haven. He did a ton of stuff in, in New York and Jersey and Philadelphia. And we all kind of debriefed him. He had a steel trap memory. He'd been in and out of the can so much that he knew everybody. I mean, that's the funny thing about sources is that, you know, that they call prison the college of evil i mean you're just you're 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 learning so much about different people and making relationships you get into these things they call them a car which is like a a a group of people that you hang around with when you're in jail and some of the best sources that i've ever worked with were guys that got into these cars whether they're in lewisburg or allenwood or otisville wherever they go with other lcn guys and that's what Nikki Skins did. He could talk to, he knew everybody. He knew people from other, fa- a lot of other families and a lot of FBI cases were, were based on his testimony. And when he killed himself, it tanked dozens of cases and probable cause for a lot of different Title III wiretaps. Yeah. And uh, let's just real quickly draw the line between Dino DePreta and Eddie Perret. Uh, in modern times, and then we can go back again. So um, Eddie hangs out at, at Doma, which is uh, his restaurant. He co- allegedly co-owns Doma with uh, Johnny Mops, <laughs> Johnny LaCourie, um, who is a Gambino guy under DePreta. Uh, what do you know about uh, Johnny Mops, Johnny the Mop? Not a whole lot. He popped up in a case that we had there was a there was a Gambino kind of a, a rebel who sat up in New Haven for years. And New England never did anything about him because he was one of these OG guys. But he was a tough dude, but he never he was a made guy. And nobody bothered him. So there was always a little bit of Gambino back and forth 
between Stanford, Bridgeport, and New Haven. He's since passed away. Passed away. His name was Eddie Riolino. And Raul Sooner, who we've been talking about, tried to shake Eddie Riolino down, and Eddie Riolino took his car keys, put all the, 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 the keys between his knuckles, and punched Sonny in the face. And Sonny wanted to kill him, and the Gambinos ended up interceding and then stopped it from happening. So um, there's always been a little bit of Gambino influence up in New Haven and a little bit of tension between New England and, 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 and Gambino. I'm Nothing sure you, too heavy. I'm pretty sure you told me that you were up on a wire where LaCory popped up. We were. Uh, he popped up on the phone. It was a bunch of calls, bookmaking type of calls. Um, nothing that we could indict him on, but he was certainly associating with those guys uh, when we were doing the Wise Kings wire. And um, he was in the middle of a lot of the stuff that they were doing. It was a very active bookmaking operation. And as I said, it was when they first started moving. It was It was the advent of the Internet. And it was the beginning of the internet, so you could you could run operations like that offshore, and away from the FBI and away from the United States, and people could keep track of their bets, and and everything was being done online. It was it was the the, the role that the LCN guys really played in it was lending the players money. That's where the crime came in, because that's how if somebody is a degenerate gambler. They have to have money to spend on on betting, so they'd look at their accounts and this guy's out of money, and the, and the, the player would come back and say, "I need ten thousand. I want to, there's a lot of football games I want to bet on this weekend," and they would extend credit, you know, with extortionate rates, and they were making a lot of money doing that. So Eddie Perret initially starts again. I know this is we're all over the place. But Eddie Peretta uh, initially starts kind of with the Gambinos as a younger guy. He goes to prison, and between going to prison and leaving prison, or in the preceding months after prison, he's kind of switched over to the Patriarchas and gets close with Beaver Ascendia, uh, and starts making a reputation for himself, at least in the Patriarchas' orbit. Uh, I know that. Providence took notice pretty quickly uh, that he's a guy that knew how to make money, keep his head down. Um, I mean, yeah, he's taken pinches before, but he's he's a he's a real stealthy guy in, in terms of how he conducts himself. And I, and I, and and added to that, fat envelopes that he can provide allegedly uh, has really endeared himself i'm told to um eddie lato and maddie guglielmetti in providence and that they have a lot of love and trust for him and that they meet with him you know there's no liaisoning because he's not a full made guy like they sit with him and sometimes they come see him they don't he doesn't necessarily always go see them most of the time he goes sees them but the fact that they would even go to connecticut says end of that case where Perrette was targeted and we, we went into and we did the case against Raul Sooner and then that came down that drove Anthony Asensia and Mario Grasso further underground there was very little activity coming from the two of them so my source contacted me and said, uh, I, I just heard that, that Bobby DeLuca came down last week. And, you know, Bobby DeLuca is obviously a... Bobby the Cigar, soldier. yeah, Pro uh, Providence uh, Capo, eventually a cooperator. Um, right. Hated Louie, hated, hated, Lou, hated Louie. Right. What happened was Bobby DeLuca came down and he met with Asensia and Grasso and said, you know, Where's your booster? Where's where's the money? Where where are the envelopes? You guys aren't doing anything down here. If you need muscle, give me a call. I'll get I'll send muscle down here. But you're not running a shy. You're not you're not doing anything. It's an embarrassment. The the money had gone from a 
steady flow to a drip uh a drip over, over the over the 10 years and it everything had just every time there was an increased law enforcement activity the further and further Ascensia and Grasso would kind of go underground and stay away from anything that could cause them to get in trouble with law enforcement but the irony of the entire thing is DeLuca has this meeting threatens them all this type of stuff and then two weeks later he flips right and he ends up flipping on the uh the case with uh with Frank Salemi's son so after that happened the the activity in New Haven dropped off to nothing it was very little going on uh LCN wise uh, when that happened because DeLuca had been the kind of liaison yeah. between Louis and Eddie Lado and and Google Google Medi and all those guys to New Haven he was the guy who took yeah. care of everything down here so Beaver might have had the button but it seems like Eddie was the one that was getting everything back together. Uh, and then when Beaver died, it, it, from what I'm told, it's allowed Eddie to kind of take control of that group. But the the Maddies and the little Eddies of the world, and I'm sure the Denunzios are, are well aware of all this too, um, they were crediting Eddie, Eddie for putting it, for getting the, the, the spigot back on on full flow right i mean you know eddie perrette was a really smart active kind of man about town type of bookmaker he knew a lot of people and as i said he when he lost the bet he paid so he had a lot of customers um and everybody knew he wasn't going to cooperate with law enforcement. Um, really active guy around the New Haven area. And he knew people from other families. He didn't cause any trouble. Uh, and he kicked up. So those type of associates, I don't know if he's a soldier now or not. I'm out of the game. But I, I don't. Those, you're, you're talking, we're talking about Eddie. I don't think he Eddie, can, I don't right. think he can be made. I don't know. It, it Probably might can't. Be the, they've but, really but they the make exceptions. Yeah, they make exceptions. It's um, not the way it used to be. He's half French. I mean, so, you know, Frank Salemi was half Irish. Right. Frank Salemi was half Irish. Jimmy Marcello, who became a boss of uh, Chicago, was half Irish. Um, there are rumors about Andy Campos, who's a who a big big time Gambino. Um, people, you know, claim that he might be partially Puerto Rican or. Um, but nonetheless, Andy Campos could become boss one day. If you, if you, if you, it's, it's all about green, man. <laughs> it's not so much about what color your blood is. It's about how, how much green you're kicking up. That's, I mean, that's really what, what's, you have a bunch of guys in LCN, they get up every day saying to themselves, how am I going to make some money today? What am I going to do? Right. And they have a specialty, whether they're a bookmaker or, you know, there's obviously been LCN activity in the stock market. You have other ones that own businesses, but you'll have these guys that are kind of, they can do a lot of different stuff to make money. Um, you know, you talk quite a bit about Joey Merlino. Don't forget, I mean, one of the things that Joey Merlino did was he needed money and he robbed the bank. Right. I mean, you know, you got to do what car. you got to do. Harvard car. Yeah, that was just, that's, that's how he first kind of blasted onto the, I mean, not really. He'd, he'd been on the scene before as a, a gopher and uh, errand boy for all those Scarfo soldiers, but that was his first kind of debut as a primetime player in the Philadelphia underworld. He got a, some headlines and then you were, it, we were just talking about it. He went away to prison and made some connections. Um, and those connections uh, were able to, you know, he was able to parlay into, backing for a war against Stanford that he won when he was 30 some years old and he's been boss ever since so the Other prison way, sentence yeah. helped the prison sentence helped joe oh yeah i mean i don't know how we probably have a lot of eagles fans listening to you but i i, I interviewed joey merlino maybe about 10 years ago and one of the things that i remember most about the interview is he's a huge patriots fan 
Oh no, he loves Brady. He's no, 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 no. Let's get it clear. He's a huge Tom Brady fan. Okay. He he he's. Well, he told me he was a Patriots fan. Well, that's because so. it's because he was Tom Brady was was on the team. Now when he Brady loves his, when Brady he moves loves the, the Sixers, ball, the Phillies, yeah, the Flyers and the Patriots. He doesn't like the Eagles. No, and so. uh, he's a um, unabashed Tom Brady uh, lover, and he and he loves himself some uh, Barstool and Dave Portnoy. Those are like his two. Uh, <laughs> those are his his like uh, if he had to put together a, uh, a a dream dinner, I think he would he would want uh, uh, a Portnoy, uh, maybe Joe Rogan and uh, and Tom Brady. Um, you know, Jeff, I mean, obviously it's pre internet, but talking about Philadelphia organized crime. The guy in the New England crime family who would fit like a glove into Philadelphia organized crime was, was Billy Grasso. Yeah. He was that type of, like a John John VC type of absolutely incredibly tough, scary guy. Yeah. That everybody was afraid of. Terrified. And that's why he, he was ruled. terrified of him. He ruled with an iron fist here. And when he died, it created this void that kind of sort of exists to this day where you have, you know, families that are elbowing each other a little bit, but nothing really heavy happened after the 89 murder. Of well, and, and it, and it made, you know, based on uh, court files and some FBI 302s and just my own sourcing uh, right after Grasso died, it, it, it made it. So the, Providence patriarchs felt like they had to come in and immediately take oversight. Um, they obviously didn't really trust anybody boots on the ground at that point, 89, 90, to take over for, for Billy. So Maddie Guglielmetti essentially took over as, I mean, he wasn't the skipper of Connecticut. He was his own skipper in Providence, but he got the responsibility of the Connecticut guys. And there was a series of meetings where uh, Maddie came, I believe Maddie came to Connecticut or they might've gone to Providence. I'm, I'm mixing it up, but within a couple days or a week of, of Grasso being killed, Google and Maddie came and got the whole Connecticut crew together and said, now you, you guys report to me now. I've heard stories from older agents and, and police officers. Billy's the kind of guy that would get out of his car and just Walk up to somebody who owed him money and hadn't paid it and crack him right across yeah. the face himself. Yeah. He didn't he didn't grab a soldier or an associate and say, well, he'd do it himself. He had no compunction about about doing that type of thing. And when you saw him coming, the, the street just cleared away. That's yeah. the type of gangster he was. It, he it, was an old time type of guy who ruled with an iron fist. Yeah. And he wasn't flashy. He was a, you know, he was a he bull in a like China shop. Stopping. Yeah, the bull in a China shop, and a, a a formidable opponent for the other families. And I, you know, obviously Raymond Patriarca saw something that he liked when he met him and when they were again in prison, and that's why he put him in charge down yeah, there. Yeah, they were cellmates. Did did uh, do you do you remember hearing anything? I mean, this was before your time. The last year or so of, of uh, Billy Grasso. Do you remember hearing about the Billy Miller situation? Yes. So yes. for people that might not know, and then I'll just get, uh, I'll get Jamie's whatever knowledge or, or anecdotes he has, but Billy Miller was a local mob collector, but he was also like a professional or semi-professional boxer. Uh, he worked with um, Sonny uh, Cast Castagna uh, and Jackie Johns. And I think it was summer of 88 or fall of 88, Grasso gets killed in summer of 89. Uh, Billy Miller goes to Franco's, which was Billy Grasso's restaurant. Um, he's taught, he's like joking with a friend of his on the sidewalk and they're kind of like calling each other racial slurs, but not, not with any like malice behind it. Um, cause he was Irish and he was talking to an Italian guy. And when you start throwing around Italian racial slurs around a guy like Billy Grasso, 
that's not gonna fly. Grasso went in a and told Billy Miller basically to shut his mouth, and and Billy Miller clocked him, like laid him out. A month later, Billy Miller is dead behind the um, wheel of his SUV. Not shocking. What I know about that case is Hartford Police Department beat their brains out trying to solve that case. And it all came down to the people that were in the car when he was murdered. And it was conflicting stories and finger pointing. And it ended up being one cooperator's word against another. And it just wasn't good enough to make an arrest. But Hartford PD really, really worked that thing real hard. And it just, unfortunately, some cold cases get, the, the, they get better with age and some don't. Because people get older and they, their memories fail and they don't want anything to do with cooperating and they just couldn't make the case. Um, I, I met with a couple of the detectives a couple of times and told them what I, the vague information that I had about it. I had passed it. I passed it on to them. I had gotten from a couple of sources, but they just never had enough to make an arrest on that case. And, but what do you think of Billy Miller? I mean, like I understand some people have tempers and they're not thinking, but th this guy knew the the ice that he was treading on, and to think that you could, I mean, even put your forget about knocking out, just putting your hands on someone like Billy Grasso or, or saying, uh, you know, some saying a word that Grasso could be offended by could get you killed and a professional fighter, your, your, your hands are basically lethal weapons. And, and you take a swing at this guy, you're just like, you might as well have just shot yourself right well, there. Yeah. It's it, And like I said, I mean, Billy had a reputation that was, I've, there's never been a gangster here in Connecticut that even touched him for how much fear he brought to opponents, civilians. Never. I no. mean, the only the only figure that I can think of that had a similar reputation. Um, he wasn't a soldier. He was an enforcer for uh, Franny Curcio, who was a made guy. Was a uh, Genovese um, Fat soldier. Franny. Fat Franny. Fat Franny um, was, there's a Hell's Angel. Yeah. Diamond Dave. Uh, Diamond Danny Byfield. I didn't say Diamond, just, da, da, Diamond Dan. I don't know why I said Diamond Dave. I was thinking yeah. of David Lee Roth. Diamond Danny Byfield. He was, he was described to me by a cooperator once as a sack of cement with a leather jacket over it. That's what he looked like. He was a jacked up, really scary enforcer for the Curcio brothers. And he's Hells Angels boss of Bridgeport. Uh, and then yep. he went down in the 2000s and, and opened up Hells Angels chapter in South Carolina. And, and he's, he is a, uh, a kind of a, a legend in Hells Angels circles, uh, someone whose reputation precedes him wherever he goes. Just got out of prison. He was chapter president down when the Hells Angels chapter was one of the most feared and violent on the East Coast um, way back when. And Danny worked for, I, I know he worked a lot with Curcio, the Curcios. Um, he might have even worked a little bit with the Gambinos, I'm not sure. But they operated, the Curcios operated strip joints down in, they still do. Um, down in Bridgeport, and Byfield was doing a lot of different stuff with them. Billy, I should say for Billy Miller, though, as I'm thinking about that case, I'm not defending him, but I am saying that I believe that he he punched Grasso out as Grasso was. I think Grasso was like charging it, so I think maybe he was going to argue self defense. Um, I. But, the vague recollection I have about the facts is I think was Grasso doing some gardening or yeah, something? Yeah, Grasso had like, say, had like gardening clippers in his hand or something. Yeah, in front of the restaurant right. when the incident occurred. Um, 
So his his days were kind of numbered once once that happened. And then you had the same around the same time, you had a, a popular restaurant tour who was also a big time bookie, uh, Billy Hot Dog Grant, um, was killed uh, in the same couple months that Billy Miller was killed. And this was all in the months preceding Billy Grasso being assassinated. Right. Um, That's right. So this was great. Uh, I'm definitely going to get Jamie back soon to talk about the role that he played in the Gardner Museum uh, investigation. Uh, and we're going to do a whole episode on that because for people that have followed the Gardner Museum um, case, you know, most infamous uh, art heist in world history, half billion dollars um, of art taken from a museum in Boston, St. Patrick's Day 90 or 91. Um, still haven't found the paintings, but for people that have followed the investigation, the investigation led right into Connecticut um, and some pretty big pieces of, of information in the investigation came out of uh, Connecticut Wise Guys. Just to tease it a little, little more, uh, I'm sure a lot of people already know this, but th these Connecticut Wise Guys weren't really, well, some of them were tied into the Patriarchas, but some of them were made guys in Joey Merlino's crew uh, from Philadelphia, and uh, the Philly guys in the in the '90s went up to to New England and made a bunch of guys. Uh, and then some of those paintings allegedly made their way to Philly in the 2000s. It's unbelievably compelling. We're going to have you back on to talk about it. But thank you so much for sharing your knowledge um, on Connecticut LCN. This was one of you know definitely one of my favorite episodes of it. Thank you very much. Anytime. Uh, Jamie, thank you so much. I'm, I'm sure the audience is going to love this. And we're going to uh, bring you a straight from the horse's mouth Gardner Museum heist episode soon. We'll have Jamie back. And then maybe we'll have Jamie back on with uh, Jeff, uh, the FBI agent that uh, that was. Um, Jeff was a lead with, guy. With the, Dan, the, Dan, the Danbury Trashers case. Right. Oh, oh, with Jeff Waterman. Oh, yeah. yeah. They, incredible. The, the whole, there was a whole team of guys that did that case. And they did a – I played a low level in it. Uh, and they, everybody in the – not only on our squad was involved in that case, the entire division. A, and one of the things I remember when they did the takedown, every heavy hitter, expensive attorney in the state of Connecticut – was in Judge Burns' courtroom that day because everybody lawyered right up and we had arrested maybe 30 people. And uh, Jimmy Galanti was the guy who ran the... Uh, that was the main guy, in the, the, the trash company guy that was at that time an associate, was right underneath Maddie the horse. Very well could be made at this point, uh, but it was his son that... Uh, he gave the trashers to. That's right. Quite go check it out on Netflix. It's a great, uh, it's a crazy story. Um, Jamie, thank yeah, you so I much. Uh, we'll again, we're teasing out what we're going to be having uh, coming down the pike for, from Connecticut OC uh, through the, the spring and summer of twenty four uh, for Jeff or for Jeff. Well, for Jeff in the future, Jeff Waterman. We're looking forward to having you on. But for Jamie, uh, for Benny. And um, everybody else, uh, OG Pod, Scott Bernstein, we're out.